so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It's 12.23am on Saturday, June 1st, 2019, and 18-year-old Theo Hayes is at Cozy Corner, a popular beach hangout spot in New South Wales coastal town of Byron Bay. Parties are common here, drinking, smoking weed, dancing... But at this time of the morning, it's also cold, dark, a bit eerie. On this particular winter's morning at the water's edge, Theo's on his phone. He's watching his favourite comedy show on YouTube. <laughs> at 12.55, he sends a message on WhatsApp to his stepsister Emma, who's back home in Belgium. It's the afternoon there, so she'll be awake. Mercy, it reads, with a kiss emoji beside it. It's the last message he sends. The next morning, he's due to check out of the Wake Up Hostel and hop on a Greyhound bus to Sydney, the final stop on his Australian adventure. After six and a half months here, he's supposed to be headed home to Belgium to start his engineering degree and the next chapter of his life. But at 1am, on that winter morning, something happened to Theo. Did he fall while climbing the steep cliffs that shelter the beach? Did he throw himself off deliberately? Or did he run into foul play? This is a missing person case that stopped Australia in its tracks. One that attracted a $500,000 reward for information. A story that to this day, three years later, has left so many questions unanswered. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with one of Australia's foremost private investigators, Ken Gamble, who's been looking into the disappearance of Belgian backpacker Theo Hayes for the last three years. Ken, before we tell this story, can you give us a little bit of an insight into what it is that you do, what your expertise is? I'm licensed by the police force to conduct investigations and surveillance and do, you know, work that is very similar to law enforcement. But a private investigator gets hired by anybody. Anybody can hire a private investigator, any individual, any corporation, even a government can hire a private person to conduct investigations. So, Essentially, I work for whoever hires me and those people will pay us a fee and they will engage us on a professional basis to conduct an investigation. And my experience goes back to 1988 when I started, Um, had 34 years experience in this particular field and a lot of my work for the past 15 years has been cybercrime. So we are still doing a lot of traditional crimes such as the investigation into Theo's disappearance. We're still doing those but I'm also doing a lot of cybercrime-related work as well. And I have a a large team around me these days, and that team consists of a a variety of different people with different expertise that is required for investigative work. So in what capacity then were you brought into the Theo story? Was that working alongside police or were you brought in after their investigation? I actually was contacted one day by David Murray, who was doing the the Lighthouse podcast about the story. And this is how I found out about the case. I was not involved in the early stages. I had heard it on the media like everybody else. I was very interested in the case. I had discussions with Dave Murray. And he specifically asked if I could look into some technical information that they were investigating as part of the podcast story. As a result of that, I started to take an interest in the case and um, I offered assistance to the family on a pro bono basis if they required any more help with anything. So in around December of 2019, I was formally engaged with a letter of authority from Theo's parents in Belgium. And at that point, I formally started representing the family 
and conducting investigations. The first thing I did was attempt to speak to the investigating police officers in Byron Bay and they refused to meet with me, which was really strange. But that was their policy at that point. They didn't want to liaise or talk to anyone privately or any private investigators. I was immediately sort of stonewalled by the police about liaising with them and about sharing information, which was a little bit of a shock at the time. Um, uh, It's not what I had expected would happen, and the family were very disappointed as well uh, that police were refusing to meet with me. So I was never involved, and to this day have never been involved in the police investigation. I'd like to go back to the start. Theo, what had he been doing in Australia since arriving on our shores in November 2018? Well, he came out here on a working holiday visa. He was interested in travelling the country. He stayed with his relatives, his godfather, down in Victoria. He travelled. He loved travelling. He was a a real adventure seeker at his age in the sense that he loved to explore nature. He, He loved the environment. He was very much wanting to travel the country. I've heard the family speak so dearly about him. I've heard so many stories about the kind of person that Theo was. And he was a very smart young man who was educated. He was polite. He was respectful. Uh, He had integrity. Uh, He was not a risk taker. He was not into drugs. He was a a normal, I guess, adventurous sort of 18-year-old backpacker uh, who we've seen, you know, swarming the shores of Australia over so many years young people that are out there for an adventure. And he was just one of those those guys. I don't know much about his upbringing prior to that, but he's got a little brother. And, you know, he was really out here for the trip of his life. And uh, it was really out of character for him to vanish in this way. Uh, certainly, there's never been any suggestion within the family that that he was depressed, that he was unhappy, To the contrary, he was living an amazing life out here. He was really involved in in a great adventure and I've been privy to looking at all the photographs and the family shots and the stuff that he was doing, his emails, his messages, right up to the point when he disappeared. And he's just a normal 18-year-old boy that that was out there having fun and mixing with people but not engaged in anything at all that would be seen as illegal or illicit or, you know, just a normal a normal kid. So he ends up in Byron Bay, which is a really popular spot for backpackers. But for those that aren't aware of that kind of slice of Australia, how would you describe Byron? Well, Byron Bay is a holiday destination for people all over Australia and, in fact, even international. It's become very well known for international tourists. It's always advertised as a place to go, particularly for backpackers. It's got beautiful beaches hostels, uh, lots of bars, clubs, cafes. It's a place that has become like a a, a mecca Mm. for travellers and particularly low-budget travellers. It it attracts a lot of low-budget travellers like the backpacker types. It's always the place to go. It's known for its parties and the lifestyle and the nightlife and it's a very attractive place for, for young people. Unfortunately, it's also known as a place that has a drug culture. Yeah. There is a drug culture in Byron. It's no secret that it's a place where you can go and buy drugs, all sorts of drugs. There's a lot of drug dealers go to Byron to try to sell drugs to uh, young people who are there on holidays. And I I have interviewed some of those drug dealers as part of my investigation. Some of them are in prison. I've done prison interviews of people who were cocaine traffickers and drug dealers that, that have told me the extent of what sort of drugs were being dealt with in Byron Bay. So there was this underbelly of Byron Bay, which the locals don't like to talk about, and certainly the police don't like to talk about it, but there is this underbelly drug culture and also homelessness. You'd be shocked at how many homeless people there are that seem to be attracted to Byron Bay that are living in the sand dunes, living in their cars, living in their vans. So this this kind of a culture, it's almost like, Back in the 70s in California, you would see all these what we used to call hippies in the old days where they would all flock together and they would camp around campfires and pitch tents and all hang out in these communes and communities. 
and Byron's become a little bit one of those places where people with, I guess, one way to describe it, alternative lifestyles, off the grid living, those type of people really love to flock to Byron. So there's kind of a, a whole array of these types of people there on a regular basis. And if you go down to Byron at any time of the day or night, you will see people performing in the parks. You'll see, you know, a lot of really interesting people there. So it's become this kind of a, a holiday mecca for for people around the world to go where there's this alternative lifestyle and, and this kind of nightlife that that's always seems to be buzzing in Byron Bay. Yeah, there's no denying it's a popular spot. So it's not surprising that Theo wanted to check it out before he went home. So he was staying in a hostel and on his third night in Byron, it's May 2019 by this point, he goes to a nightclub called Cheeky Monkeys. Under what circumstances did he leave that nightclub that night? Well, he he was at the nightclub for a period of time, more than one hour. I, I think it was one or two hours he was there. He was having a few beers. He was dancing. He was having a great time like everyone else there. It's a nightclub. There's music. He at one stage may have climbed on a table to dance and maybe was. I think he was told to, to move or to get off the table. And at some stage the, the bouncers have determined that he was intoxicated and that he should be removed from the club. They have obviously strict rules and regulations about drinkers and they determined that he was intoxicated and he should be removed from the club. So uh, later that evening, he was told to leave the club. And upon leaving the club, he questioned the reasons why he was having to leave and the bouncers told him he didn't put up a, a fight or anything like that. He he accepted it and he walked off. And at that point in time, he he was immediately on his phone, immediately Googling the way back to his hostel, but he walked the wrong way. He didn't walk the way to the hostel. He walked around the corner down a street in the opposite direction from his hostel. And we should point out that his friends didn't think he was overly drunk who were with him at the time, did they? No, no, he certainly wasn't overly drunk. He was potentially reaching a point of intoxication. I I think he'd, he'd had a few beers. That's about it. He wasn't intoxicated or drunk by any means. And that's quite evident when you can see the video of him coming outside and then walking off quite briskly. There is a little bit of a sway to his walk, but, you know, anyone that has a few beers may have a slight sway, but he was certainly not drunk and he was not intoxicated. He wouldn't have been able to, you know, walk that distance that he did and take that route had he had been, you know, heavily intoxicated. So, Certainly, we don't believe that he was affected all that much by the alcohol. So you mentioned that he puts the Google directions into his phone and he walks in the opposite direction and not far into his walk, he stops for seven minutes at a rec grounds. Firstly, how on earth do we even know that in the first place, that he stopped for seven minutes? Well, the most compelling thing about this case is that we obtained all of the Google cellular data and the Google takeout data that was tracking his every move. So the GPS was turned on at that point in time on his phone. So he had location services turned on and Google was actually tracking his movements metre by metre. So we were later on able to go into his Google account and we were able to view his every move, every step that he made that night we were able to view that and we were able to see that he went down the road, he turned left, he went down Tennyson Street, he stopped at the end of Tennyson Street. Now, whilst he was walking down that route, he was on his phone looking at Google Maps. He was actually looking at the way to the hostel to get his bearings. He was clearly intending to go back to that hostel. There are multiple times throughout the evening that he searched for the hostel, but When he arrived at the end of Tennyson Street, he stopped at some cricket nets. Now, we know that those cricket nets are next to a small homeless camp Mm -hmm. and that there is a – when I was there in December, there were uh, remnants of a fireplace that had been made in that exact location where he stood. So what we know from the GPS data is that he went down the end of that street, he crossed the road, he walked into a little – 
section behind the cricket nets, which is very close to a homeless camp in the bushes. And he stood there and he loitered for six minutes. When I say loitered, we know from the GPS we can see the movements because every few seconds he's logging a GPS point. So we could see a cluster of GPS points, which means that he was standing there and he was moving slightly, but he was standing there. And that's very compelling evidence because he was not stopping there for, a uh, say, a toilet break or something like that. He was there for six minutes. He was doing something there. He didn't appear to be on his phone because there was no indication that he was sitting there talking on his phone. There were no phone records to suggest that he was on his phone. So the only conclusion that we could draw and and the most logical conclusion was that he had stopped there to talk to somebody Mm. and was engaged in a conversation with someone and as a result of that, that he was loitering around and talking and there was movement. And then he immediately left that location and went across a park and then went down towards the beach. So that sort of cluster of GPS points became a major focus of my investigation. Did the police agree with you that he must have been talking to someone at that point? No, no, not at all. The police never even had that information initially. Mm -hmm. In fact, the police had already concluded in their own minds that Theo had fallen off the cliff and vanished at sea before they even had the benefit of investigating this type of data. They did have some limited data from WhatsApp. They had some data from Google. They certainly had phone data. They had phone records. But they didn't have the Google takeout data. That came later because the family were the ones that actually accessed that data. The police didn't access that data. They weren't allowed to. So I'm surprised that that in a missing person case of this nature that the police didn't access that information immediately upon the person being reported because that's the sort of information we would immediately look at, is whether there's GPS, whether there's phone records, whether there's cellular data, whether there's signal data, anything that will determine the position of the person at that particular time. I don't know how long it took the police to look at that data. I'm I'm not even aware how much effort was put into the, the examination of that data initially. I don't think there was much effort at all in the beginning, and I don't want to criticise the police because they... They have a lot of things going on. And at that point, he was only a missing person. He could have showed up at any time in another town or another city or even another state. No one was suspecting at that time that there was foul play. The police didn't suspect foul play, but they did draw a conclusion in their own mind that he had had an accident off the cliffs. And I think that was the working theory for police in the very beginning. So they started to close their mind about looking at other other theories at that time. And when I came into the investigation, in fact, most of the reason why I immediately offered my assistance is because I, I could see flaws in the investigation in the beginning by police drawing a conclusion that he'd gone off the cliff without sufficient evidence to prove it. We know that Theo's last known point or data point is Cozy Corner at Tallow Beach. Can you explain what that area is like? It is a beautiful place. Cozy Corner is at the end of a long beach which is kind of sheltered by cliffs and bushland and and it's a beautiful place. It's somewhere where there's a lot of campers going, light fires at night, but the cliffs behind it would be considered almost ominous. You would not want to go on those cliffs because they are very steep, they are very high, and they go straight down to the waterfront. In fact, they're not even a a direct drop. They are on an angle, which is another very important issue that had to be considered during the coronial inquest is the angle of the cliffs. But it's quite scary at night. For anyone to be in that place alone at night when there's no moon, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't want to go down there at night myself. I've been down there at night at midnight. I went down there, I retraced all the steps. It's a little bit scary for the average person to go down Mm. to this kind of place at night. There's these campers on the beach. 
you don't know what sort of people are in the bushes. It's a bit of a scary place, I would say, for the average person at that time of night, particularly when there's no moon and no light out there. From your description, it also seems like the kind of place that would be an unusual place for a tourist to go. Like why would he even know to go there? Well, it's quite commonly known amongst the backpackers and among the hostels. Cozy Corner is renowned for having parties on a Friday night. It's renowned for having beach parties and what they call doofs where people take drugs and they stand around a campfire and they party all night till the sun comes up. It was known for that. There had been lots of those types of parties at Cozy Corner in the past. So I don't think it was unusual for him to want to go down and check out Cozy Corner because he probably heard people at the hostel talking about it. He may have spoken to locals and they may have said, you know, sometimes on Friday nights there's these parties down there. The idea of a beach party was something that excited Theo. This was something that was very exciting to him. The idea of meeting locals and hanging out at a beach party, that was quite an exciting prospect. So there is a chance that that he had that information, that he had spoken to somebody about potentially going to Cozy Corner or at least Tallow Beach, may not have necessarily been Cozy Corner, but there was certainly a strong desire that night once he went down to Tennyson Street and loitered for that six-minute period, he suddenly had a desire to go down towards that beach. And I think that's, again, a very interesting thing to be considered when we look at all the evidence in this case, we have to look at his reasoning at that point in time for going across a park, taking a shortcut, not going around the roads but going through a football oval into back streets through these twisty roads and onto a very dark and ominous track that leads down into bushland which had homeless people living in there. I think it was out of character and unusual for Theo to take that route if he was by himself. What does his digital trail that evening tell us about his frame of mind? I believe that you could even track what he was searching. Yeah, that's right. And he conducted searches on his phone. He Googled another small city during the evening called Korokai, and we were very interested in why he did that. Korokai is a small community. It has a crime problem there. It has only a small population, but there is a significant crime problem in in Korokai like there is in a lot of these small towns up there. He had searched nothing abnormal, um, but there was some searches later in the evening. One of them was searching for hotels in Byron Bay, and that was a very interesting search of to why he was searching for hotels in Byron Bay. There was also a point when he was on the beach when he watched a couple of minutes of his favourite YouTube series, Burger Quiz, which was a Belgium show. There was nothing really in those searches that would indicate that he was in any trouble, that he was concerned. It was really just normal online behaviour. But I think most notably about the data is that he was consistently searching for the Wake Up Hostel. He was consistently wanting to know his bearings and where he was in relation to the hostel. And that was something that he repeated throughout the evening, is that he wanted to know where he was and he wanted to know the direction of how to get back to the hostel. So there were numerous searches of Wake Up Hostel right up until the point where his phone was used for the last time, around 1am. And the interesting thing about his online behaviour when he was in Cozy Corner, and I think this is really important and something that probably hasn't been really considered a lot, certainly been considered a lot by us and by the volunteers and the various people that have have been really immersed in this case, but he was in that location for an hour. He was in Cozy Corner for an hour. We know that from his GPS data, and yet during that one-hour period, there's very little evidence that he was on his phone searching, chatting to people. There was very little evidence of him being active on that phone the whole time. So that raises mm. a, a very important question as to what he, what was he doing there 
if he wasn't using his phone all that time. He did use his phone a couple of times, but there was a long period of time when there's no activity on his phone. And again, that is pretty compelling evidence that he was engaged in something else. What that something else is, nobody knows, but it does create a strong inference that he may have been with somebody else. And that's kind of the conclusion that we have drawn based on all of the evidence that we've seen. There also comes a point where his geolocation is turned off. Is that something he has to do manually? Why would he do something like that? Yes, and, that, and that's been a topic of you know a lot of discussion. Why did he turn his location services off? The simple reason is that he he would have been wanting to conserve his battery because location services chew up a lot of battery power and it wasn't unusual for him to turn his location services off. Apparently there were past incidents where he he had also turned his location services off to save battery. So we, we know at 12.05 a.m. his location services turned off. Now the manner in which they were turned off is very interesting because he walked up the hill, he paused kind of in the middle of these bushes, and I've been there and I've sat there at night and I'm trying to figure out why someone would walk up and sit in the bushes for five minutes and then come back down the hill again. Very difficult to comprehend why he would do that. Uh, but he went up into the bushes, walked about 50 metres to 75 metres up off the beach into the bushes, sat there or stayed in that exact location for five minutes and then he walked back down onto the beach and he walked right down to the side of the waterfront where the waves were crashing in on the beach. And it was at that point, right next to the water, that he turned his location services off. It's a mystery as to why he did that, but we do know from the data that he remained in that general location up until 1am. And that was established through extensive other analysis uh, using signal data and other data. So what are his last known searches, data points, anything at 1am? Well, there was several very interesting points that came out of the investigation. One of them, an IP address was logged at four minutes to 1am, which was about five minutes before he became... I believe, disconnected from his phone. Mm -hmm. I believe at 1am or just after 1am, perhaps a couple of minutes past 1am, something has happened to him where his phone was no longer being used. And just prior to 1am, there is a ping. There is a cellular ping which leaves an IP address which geolocates to the Lawson Street Tower in Byron Bay. Now, this became a really interesting examination for for us and for our geospatial analysts because there was a there were here, here we have a ping on this tower that can help to determine location and distance from the tower and that happened just prior to 1 a.m which is when we believe something happened to him now that's one hour after he arrived in cozy corner now police and other experts believe that there's a chance he could have climbed up the cliff. There's no real uh, hard evidence to prove whether that occurred. There is some geospatial evidence to suggest that his phone may have moved in a northerly direction away from Cozy Corner. But this is not an exact science that we're talking about. Geospatial analysis is not an exact science. So nobody can really say conclusively that this is what happened. This signal data examination is not an exact science. It's only indicators that can determine certain things. One thing we can determine was that his phone reached an IP address just prior to 1am, and that IP address was a Telstra IP that was connected to a tower and that, that I believe it was logged because of a WhatsApp message, and that's because if you connect to the internet while you're at Cozy Corner, if you go onto Google or Google Maps or any application, even if you go onto WhatsApp and send a message or an image, you will log an IP address in a dynamic network of IP addresses that come from the towers, from the Telstra towers. Now, he was a Telstra user. He had a Telstra account. And there was some very compelling evidence 
uh, that I found on his Telstra bill, and that was the fact that his phone was consistently connecting to data right through to the early afternoon of the next day. And this was another very interesting finding that we made early in my investigation, and I, I don't know whether police had established this or not. Certainly we had no knowledge of whether the police had this information, but just looking at his phone bill told us that during the evening and during the early morning hours of 1st of June, all the way through the morning right up until just after 1 p.m. on Saturday, the 1st of June, his phone was occasionally hitting the data tower and leaving a log. So we were able to determine without any doubt that his phone remained on and in that area for at least 24 hours more. So in other words, his battery was still alive, the phone was on, and occasionally that phone was pinging the tower, getting data. So I guess that tells us that he didn't, well, the phone didn't end up in the water which is what police think happened to him. Absolutely. It would be a very unusual circumstance where someone's fallen in the water and to an extent that they have been washed away at sea and that the phone didn't go with them because if he's fallen in the water, the phone would have either been in his hand or it would have been in his pocket. Now, if it was in his pocket, you would think that it would have gone in the water with him and the the phone would not have lasted in the water. We did tests to see how long a phone would last. It would be extremely unusual for the phone to be on for too long in the water. It may stay on for a certain period of time. And there are cases where phones have stayed on while they've been submerged in water. There have been cases. We have checked with experts in the military and, and, and uh, we've spoken to a lot of people and we have established that it is possible that a phone can remain on for a period of time if it's in in someone's pocket and and it's somewhat protected from the water. But it's very difficult to believe that if he's fallen straight into the water, that that phone didn't go with him. And we do know and we can confirm with great confidence based on all the evidence that that phone did not go in, in the water and that that phone remained on until the next day when the battery must have gone flat. And we never found that phone, did we? No. The phone was never located. Now, there is a possibility that if he did fall, that the phone got lodged on a ledge or a rock. Based on all the other evidence that we've seen in this case, I don't accept the proposition that he fell off the cliffs. I just don't accept it. I don't believe the evidence shows that that's a logical conclusion based on all the evidence that we've seen. So that's not something that I would accept as as a theory as to what happened to Theo. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with private investigator Ken Gamble about the disappearance of Theo Hayes. When was the alarm first raised that Theo was even missing? The 6th of June... Six days after, the first couple of days, it wasn't really known. It's not unusual for backpackers not to come back to their their hostel, so it was a couple of days before it was even raised and reported, and it took a while. Then the family obviously tried to contact him, and there was concern, but there wasn't concern at that early stage that he had met foul play or that he had vanished. Uh, You know, there was a concern that he may have gone off to a party or You know, uh, there was certainly concern about what had happened, but there wasn't any grave concerns at that point. It wasn't until the 6th when the family reported to police. Once he was reported as a missing person, obviously Theo's not from Byron, but how did the community react to this missing 18-year-old? The community reacted very strongly when it came out that Theo was missing, you know, In fact, the community responded in an amazing way and one of the greatest assets that the family has had in this case is the community of Bonham Bay and I have to, I can only speak highly of the amount of effort and time and energy and love and support that the family of Bonham Bay has 
given the family and everyone else, including myself, the support throughout this whole ordeal. But in the early stages, there was a certain core group of volunteers that have stuck on this case until this very day and will continue until this mystery is solved. And those volunteers, they set up their own search parties. They started doing an enormous amount of work. And these are local people who live in the community who heard about this tragic story of this young man disappearing and wanted to get involved in in the search, wanted to contribute, wanted to help. So really the community of Byron Bay really jumped on board and banded together. There were press releases. Uh, When it started to become apparent that something was really wrong, that Theo really had vanished, there was something not right about this whole story, the fears grew. His parents came out. They they got involved in the search as well. It it was tragic. It was tragic at that point because obviously something had happened to him and nobody knew what. There was even a ransom message sent to the family by some horrible cyber criminals overseas saying that they had information about where Theo was. They were demanding money. I mean, this is the sort of thing that families have to go through when you're you're dealing with a tragedy like this. There's cyber criminals there wanting to exploit it. And I thought that was a real horrible thing to do. But obviously that was all false. Like they were false ransom calls. It was all false. The scammers trying to capitalise on their grief to make money. Those searches, did they produce anything? Because the whole community and police were out looking. Yes. Well, of course, the initial searches didn't produce anything at all of any uh, interest. The initial police searches, they were quite extensive. They, they had helicopters in there. They had SES volunteers. They did, did what they would do in any missing persons case. They band together a lot of professionals and they, they did a lot of searching. There was extensive searches conducted, but those searches probably weren't in the right place. But what was found during July when some follow-up searches were done by the volunteers after we found all the GPS data and were able to to retrace his steps, they found the cap. And that was a big breakthrough because that was Theo's cap and it was sitting on the ground in those bushes right along that very trail where the GPS points were located. So at that point, obviously, there was no doubt in the mind of those close to Theo that that was his cap because that was the cap that he always wore. Of course, police had to test it. They had to eventually get DNA to prove that it was his cap and that was established that it was his cap. So the reason that that cap came off and under what circumstances is another interesting thing for investigators to examine because he was very attached to that cap because he used it to hold his hair back. It was unusual for him to lose his cap or to drop his cap and not want to pick it up. And all we can think of is that he was moving through that bush at quite a speed to get out of there, potentially onto the beach. Maybe he wasn't aware that his cap was knocked off until he went got to the beach. It's really unknown, but certainly it was absolutely conclusive evidence and proof that he had passed through that exact area, that he had lost his cap and that he had gone onto the beach and then he had gone onto the beach and walked down to Cozy Corner. Police maintain the position that they think that he slipped and fell into the water and drowned. You don't think that's what happened. You think that there's foul play involved and that's what a lot of people think. Why don't police seem interested in exploring that other avenue that he might have run into foul play? Well, it depends which police you talk to. Some police don't believe the theory of him falling off the cliffs. I've spoken to senior police officers that don't accept that theory. We're talking about police who have different skill sets, different levels of experience, detectives that may not have a lot of experience in these sorts of cases, certainly not a lot of experience in signal data or dealing with cellular data or dealing with all of this digital evidence, the average detective is not experienced or even trained to deal with that type of evidence. So the traditional methods of establishing a crime scene and establishing what may have happened have been used in this case and they have, because of his location at the time, 
because he vanished, because of the dangers of the cliffs, because of all those practical reasons, they've drawn a conclusion without looking at the digital evidence. So I believe that police, certainly investigating detectives that have looked at the evidence in detail, have had a change of mind about what could have happened to him for the same reasons that we had a change of mind when we saw all the evidence, that there are compelling trails that have been left behind. There's a lot of incredible digital trail which needs thorough and comprehensive analysis to be able to make determinations. It's not necessarily conclusive, but there is strong and compelling evidence to suggest that he may have been with somebody on that night. And that would explain why uh, his body has not been located. It would indicate that foul play may have occurred. His phone has been taken from him or he's lost his phone at around 1am. That phone has not been thrown in the water. It's not been smashed. It's not been disconnected. It's been left somewhere on and connecting to the networks for 24 more hours. So I believe when you look at all of the evidence put together, I believe that that Theo has met foul play of some sort. Theo's family set up a website to get tips from the community. I want you to tell me about the tip that led you to a house in Nimbin and whether that was of significance or how that was of significance to Theo's story. Yes, it was a, an anonymous tip that came in in relation to some conversations that were overheard in a hotel in a small town near Byron Bay. And those conversations were heard by a person who was the person that reported this information to the family. In fact, they reported it to the police as well, but they didn't get much of a response from the police. The police had actually discounted the information as being credible. There were some attempts to interview the person that made these allegations, and the allegation was that someone in this small town had knowledge of what happened and, in fact, was even there on the night that Theo disappeared and had spoken about this in a pub and that these people, this small group of people, knew exactly what happened to Theo and that he had accidentally died as a result of a potentially some sort of drug. This is what the allegation was. And this is public now, so I I can talk about some of this information. And as a result of that information, I went to this small town and I interviewed some of the people that were involved, I guess some of the people that were on the fringe of the, the person that made the allegation. I went to the pub. I interviewed the people in the pub. I interviewed the barmaids, the manager. I interviewed lots of people. And I was able to establish the name and identity of the person that made the allegations. And as a result of that, I started investigating him. I approached him to be interviewed. He refused to be interviewed initially. In fact, he ran away from the house the first time I went there. The second time I went there, he ran away as well, or he was absent. And it wasn't until quite some months later that I went back again. It was when the anniversary of him going missing, when that occurred, I went back again a third time to try to get to the bottom of this information because I believed, I always suspected, I had a a gut feeling, a hunch, you know, whatever you want to call it, that there may be some sort of truth in this information. But most importantly, it needed to be thoroughly investigated and examined, really exhausted as to whether or not this is just someone sprouting in a pub or whether there's actually something in this and that it could be a lead. So, Eventually, I managed to interview this person, and as a result of that, this person, a male, denied everything, but whilst denying it, he did give me information about certain people that he believed could be involved, and he gave me the reasons why. So I then went on a, on a, on a mission, myself and another investigator, to track down some of these people that were named, and I went to Ballina and other small towns around the community and I conducted a series of interviews, and one person that I interviewed had said to me that she is aware of the story, she's aware of this allegation, she knows all about it, and she's heard the same story herself, and that she knows, because she was told, 
that Theo's belongings were dumped in, a, in an abandoned house in Nimbin, and she named the people that allegedly dumped the belongings. So myself, my other investigator, went to Nimbin and we started conducting a search for any abandoned houses. And when we spoke to locals in the middle of the city, they said there's only one real abandoned house and that's one just a couple of kilometres out of town. And it's also known to be occupied by homeless people occasionally. So it's probably the only one really. So we contacted the owner. We got permission to go and conduct a search of that house And as a result of that search, and in fact, it was all recorded on video as we were undertaking the search, we came across the belongings of Thea Little. Thea Little was another person who was found deceased in the same location where Theo disappeared. And Mm. I was pretty shocked to find that information because we walked into this horrible old house. It was all abandoned and there'd been rain, water leaking through the roofs and it was half the ceilings were caved in. It was... It was a very um, scary place to be at night, put it that way. Uh, But we were there in the daytime. And when I walked into the house, the first thing we noticed was all of these, this sort of backpackers' clothing and and all this backpacker stuff. And as soon as I saw that, I went, oh my God, this could be Theo's belongings of some sort. But we know his belongings were recovered, so that his belongings were at the hostel. So it didn't really make sense to us that his belongings were taken there. But, of course, we were looking for his phone. That was the main thing we were looking for was his phone. Could the phone have been dumped there? Could this information be accurate? So when we discovered the belongings of Thea Little and we realised immediately that Thea Little was another person who had vanished and had been found deceased in in a camp in Tullow Beach, we immediately reported to police. Detectives came out there. The media arrived that night. They did a story on it. Uh, We passed all the information to police. We concluded our search the next day. We couldn't do it at that time because police recovered some of that information, some of the belongings of Thea Little. And at that point, you couldn't help but to become suspicious that, that there was some connection here. Why did this person direct me to go to this house? And I just happened to find the belongings of a person who's found deceased in the same location of where Theo disappeared. So, of course, <laughs> you know, that to me raised a red flag and, and it raised concerns that there may be a connection between these cases. Obviously, this is all still ongoing. We had an inquest into Theo's disappearance that was held in 2022. It wrapped up only a few months ago. Did we get any more information, any more clarity, anything else to go on from that? No, interestingly, none of the information that I uncovered during my investigation, including the house in Nimbin, none of that was really explored in the coronial inquest because there was no evidence at all to prove or to establish that the information we were given was correct. So the police, whilst they may be investigating those allegations, there is nothing to establish at this point in time, even to this day, that any of that information is credible. Could these people be making up a story? You know, uh, are we on a wild goose chase? So the information was not tendered as part of the coronial inquest because they were really looking, the coronial inquest looks at all the factual information that can be determined and and they're just, I I believe that there was probably insufficient evidence to, to prove that the information we uncovered was connected to Theo. I was not called as a witness for the same reasons because my investigation is ongoing. My reports that were were tendered to the coroner, the coroner did reach out to me and request my reports and I was happy that they did that because I believed the reports that I provided needed the police to, to continue those investigations because there's only so much that we can do. There were certain persons of interest that needed to be investigated and needed to be located and needed to be interviewed. So that information just didn't come out in the, in, the, in the inquest. Where do we stand in relation to this case now? Do you still hold hope that we'll get answers for Theo's family? Yes, I do. I would never give up holding hope because what I do know is there have been hundreds of leads that have come forward over the years. Only a handful of those leads I would regard as credible 
In other words, it's information that should be investigated. There's been some very credible information come in even this year, a story that came from a backpacker about a certain individual that was in Byron at the time that leads us to believe that there may be a person of interest that we should be looking at. Um, this is all part of an ongoing investigation that has been all handed over. All of this has been handed over to the Missing Persons Registry who are reinvestigating some of these allegations and some of these reports that have come in. And they're doing a very good job of it. They're, they're doing a very thorough job. I wish they'd done a thorough job in the beginning of this case, but certainly now they are pursuing all of these avenues. And I believe, I still believe, and I will always believe that somebody knows something about what happened to Theo. I do believe that he was with somebody that night, that he met with someone and somebody uh, encouraged him or invited him to go down through that route to the beach and that there was potentially some engagement with other other people. And if that's the case, then the suggestion of foul play uh, would be uh, quite an accurate one. Thanks to Ken Gamble for joining us on today's episode. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know by leaving a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. It helps other true crime fans find our content and it helps us keep making the episodes you get to enjoy every week. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.